Hello, I am Suzanne Faith, and I'm the program manager for Cape Cod Healthcare's Dementia and Alzheimer's Caregiver Support Program. We're part of Cape Cod Neurology, and our purpose is to educate and support caregivers that are managing some form of dementia and need help in understanding the complications and problems that might arise as the disease progresses with their family member. We do care planning and all our services are free of charge. We also run a variety of support groups and like today, this will be one of a three-part series that we are making available on our website so that you can have access to our education anytime you wanna review it, consider it, and think about what might be going on with your family member. So what is dementia? Well, dementia is a medical term that refers to the loss of intellectual functions, such as thinking, remembering, and reasoning, which are severe enough to interfere with the individual's daily function. Dementia is not a specific disease, but rather a group of symptoms that may appear in certain disease conditions. In addition to the loss of cognitive function, changes in personality, mood, and behavior may also occur. So the big question that people often ask is, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? And I know that this is confusing to many people in the community. And often when people call the office, they say, that their family member has dementia, but they don't know what form of dementia they have. So the analogy for me as a clinician would be if someone said that they had an infection, you would want to know where the infection was and what was the cause of the infection so you could treat it. Unfortunately, there is no treatment for dementia. There are a few drugs available that help the neurons communicate a little better in the brain, but it doesn't stop the pathology of the disease from progressing. And so if you look at this diagram, you can better understand the concept of dementia being a group of symptoms rather than a specific disease process. The, the most common form of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's, it's called Alzheimer's because it was named after Dr. Alzheimer who found the disease. Then we have vascular dementia, which is commonly a dementia we see in people that are having small TIAs, transient ischemic attacks, or little mini strokes which in and of itself are not uh, terrible and they generally don't affect the individual. However, they are cumulative. And often people will have a vascular dementia start which will unmask the pathology of Alzheimer's disease. And if that's the case, we say that the individual now has a mixed dementia. It's Alzheimer's and vascular together, which actually is very, very common. Frontal temporal dementia, which I'll talk about in the lecture today, and Lewy body dementia are probably, these are the, the top five dementias, but in total we have at least 80. Sometimes I've read that there are more than 400 forms of dementia. All of them are progressive, and with the exception of one or two, uh, which are what we call static dementias that occur maybe from a stroke that happens as a one-time event without any other problems. Um, as I said, unfortunately, they're all progressive. So with that, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Alzheimer's disease, since that is the most common form of dementia, and what the cause is. The functioning unit of the brain is a neuron. And in our brains, we have 100 billion neurons. So you've probably heard before that we don't use anywhere near the brain capacity that we have available to us. Whether that's true or not, you know, it's, it's not my point to, to make today. But what I wanted to talk to you about is that 
all dementias really are interfering with the communication system in the brain. And the communication system in the brain starts with the neuron. And for, for those of you watching this at home, which probably is the majority of you, you might be thinking, oh gosh, this is not what I thought I was gonna learn in this class today. But it actually is really important for you to understand because if you know how the brain is supposed to work, then you can understand the problems that might occur when the brain begins to break down. So let's say we have neuron A and neuron B out of the 100 billion that I had told you about. So I'm gonna label this A and I'm gonna label this B. And basically, Neuron A sends a signal to neuron B, it jumps the gap here, and so on and so, so forth, and chains to the area in the brain for recognition. And those of you that are interested in Alzheimer's disease or may have a family member with Alzheimer's disease have probably read that the two culprits in uh, the pathology that creates the problem is something called beta amyloid, which is a protein that exists in our brain. Everybody has it. But somehow in the, the brains of people who become affected with Alzheimer's disease, the brain receives a signal that it's under attack and the protein starts to overproduce. And when it overproduces, it begins to um, glob together on the outside of the neuron, creating a plaque, very similar to the protein plaque that you have on your teeth and that you need to go to the dentist to have scraped off. But in this case, the brain can't cleanse itself. So the protein begins to accumulate on the outside of the neuron. On the inside of the neuron, we have filaments, which are made up of another protein called tau, T-A-U. And I, I say that that's very much like the fiber optic network. You know, a 5G, the more filaments you have within a, a tube or a wire, the greater the transmission of the signal. But as the amyloid starts um, caking up and causing plaque on the outside of the neuron, these tau filaments begin to break and you have something called neurofibrillary tangle. So the two hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease are amyloid plaque, and neurofibrillary tangles. So in order to have Alzheimer's disease, you have to have this. And in order to have Alzheimer's disease, you have to have both amyloid plaque and neurofibrillary tangles. There are other dementias that have neurofibrillary tangles, but not the two together. And so the question is often arises as to how do we get a diagnosis? It used to be the old saying that, or the common belief, I should say, that you could not definitively tell whether someone had Alzheimer's disease until they had an autopsy. And I understand, having done this work for 36 years, that many people don't want to admit that their family member has Alzheimer's disease. But it's important that you find out what, what is the cause of dementia, it, if at all possible. So, if you're concerned, first of all, I will say that the new Medicare regulations that came out, I think in 2012 actually, now allow your primary care doctor to do a memory screen on you every year for free on your annual physical. If he, she is concerned, 
they can then take the next step, do some blood work to see if there's something metabolic going on. And also, if they continue to be concerned or if that shows nothing, the blood work shows nothing, then they will refer you to the neurology department at Cape Cod Healthcare. And then you'll see a neurologist who will do a full workup. Generally, that will be an MRI and sometimes a neuropsych eval on top of the, the basic memory screen and blood work that was done. And generally, with all of that testing, they can really begin to pinpoint what, what kind of disease or what kind of dementia your family member may have. Um, if you are enrolled in any of the clinical studies, they now do a PET scan where they insert a radioisotope and it will light up the amyloid so they can definitively tell whether or not you have Alzheimer's disease by seeing the amyloid. But those tests are only available for people in a clinical trial. So um, don't expect to ask the neurologist for one because they're not available yet for anybody outside of the clinical studies. So I'm going to go back to the board and I'm going to talk a little bit about the disease and how it progresses through the brain. But first I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the brain is set up. And it's really not as complicated as people think. So I, I know that there'll be some additional information on the website that you can download so that you can follow along. So here's a depiction, my own, a little artistic license here, of the brain uh, within the, the human head, though it's all awfully enlarged, I should say. And I wanted to point out a few things uh, before I start the, in, the lecture on the disease process in the brain. So, we basically have four main files in the brain. And this file here is the temporal lobe. And the temporal lobe is language and hearing. If you think about it, the ear is right here. This is your frontal lobe. And we're gonna be going over these again but your frontal lobe is your um, execution and planning. It's your social, social personality. It's your reasoning. Your parietal lobe, which is up here. So your, the parietal lobe incorporates everything that we've ever learned from infancy to adulthood that involves movement. And then your occipital lobe is your vision. So again, like your visual dictionary, everything you've ever seen and attached to a label to is stored there. And then deep underneath the temporal lobe is a structure called the limbic system. Let's see, let me get a, so this is not, this area is called the limbic system. And it's the oldest part of the brain and it's connected to the brain stem. And it sits underneath the temporal lobe. And the reason that it's important in understanding brain function is that it has three structures, the hippocampus, the hypothalamus, and the thalamus. And this structure here, I'm gonna call it the hippocampus, is really the big campus. So the hippocampus is important, particularly in Alzheimer's disease, for a number of reasons. But what I want to have you as the audience understand today, that we are all sensory beings and we receive 
signals to our senses, whether it's hearing, smell, taste, sound, touch, and all of the senses, whether we're being touched on our skin or our toe or we're hearing the lawnmower down the street, all of our senses feed into the hippocampus. And then the hippocampus decides if it's important enough for us to have recognition for, and then it will open the gate and let that information into the different area of the brain where it needs to go for recognition. The problem with Alzheimer's disease is that the amyloid plaque starts to build up first in the hippocampus. And so basically that renders the gate closed for new sensory information. So how would that manifest? How would that look? Basically, that is the, the number one problem that caregivers tell us about in that the 15 second loop or the constant repetition of thought. And why does that occur? It occurs because you're providing your family member with new information such as uh, what time is it? Or what are, what are we having for dinner? Or where are we going? And whatever your answer is, that's new information. Because it's new information, it's, it, the signal tracks have not been laid down yet in the brain, so it can't get past the gate. Whereas you, to your family member, are not new, so they recognize you, know your name, etc. So that's understanding the role of the hippocampus in Alzheimer's disease is very, very important. Now, most people are, will call the office and they'll tell us what stage they think their family member is in, or they want to know what stage their family member is in. And that, you know, there's actually a very distinct way of knowing. And I use, or here at our program, we use a three-stage model as opposed to the Alzheimer's Association that uses a seven-stage model. So the difference being that the seven-stage model takes the three stages and further subdivides them. But for all intents and purposes, it's a lot easier to just think early, middle, and late. So early stage lasts two to five years. There's no across the board. Everybody's different in how it progresses. Though I, I do want to mention before I forget that there is a form of Alzheimer's called young onset or early onset. They changed the name from early onset to young onset because people were confusing it with early stage disease. But that is when somebody has the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease before they're age 65. So when you get a diagnosis of a young onset Alzheimer's disease, it generally is more rapidly progressing. So sometimes people can go from diagnosis to um, end of life in six years. Um, typically, uh, if you use the two to five years, each stage is two to five years, people can have the disease anywhere from six years to 15. So, the, you know, again, it depends on one's general health and other factors in terms of how someone is gonna progress through the disease. So never look at yourself or your family member and somebody else and say, oh, that's gonna be exactly how it's gonna be for me. So, with that, so we're talking about the early stage. And in the early stage, as I said, the disease starts here in the hippocampus and it moves in this semicircle here. So it, it spreads somewhat into the temporal lobe. And as I said, the temporal lobe is responsible for language and what you tend to see as a manifestation early in the disease process 
is when someone is feels like they have the word on the tip of their tongue and they just can't bring it to the surface. And of course, those that's all of us as we age, we also have that. So don't please don't call and say, oh my God, I heard your lecture and I think, yes, I have early stage Alzheimer's disease. You know, it, it, you have to have more problems than just that. And certainly if you wait a minute, the word will float to the surface. But generally people begin to have trouble with word finding. And as that progresses in the early stage of the disease, it's also difficulty with verbal fluidity. Also, as the disease moves up into the frontal lobe, we see difficulty in planning and execution, which may again manifest as something similar to going to this, the grocery store and forgetting certain items because the, the execution of the plan didn't work out exactly the way that was written on the shopping list or um, forgetting important dates. Um, this is when we begin to see people having trouble with their checkbook, um, maybe receiving a bill, writing a check, putting it in an envelope so there's a sequential step. And if the bill is still front and center, it may be that by the time the check went in the envelope, they forgot that they wrote the check. And so they write duplicate checks for the same bill. So that's another common problem. And if you're noticing any of these things, it's really important to start planning early because you need to have your legal affairs in order sooner rather than later because at a certain point your family member is not going to be able to sign legal documents and be competent to be signing legal documents. But in this stage, people are still competent. Many people are still driving though with caution. Um, and it's during this first stage, if you were to go to the neurologist or your primary care doctor, they would probably prescribe for you one of the two classes of drugs that are available. And what it, one is an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, denezepel or Aricept is the most common. Um, it also is a, there's another drug called Exelon, comes as a patch. But what they do, what these drugs do, is they stimulate the neurons to talk to each other. Uh, as I told you earlier, the basic problem in a dementia is that the brain is, is dying. And so the neurons are dying off, the brain is shrinking, and the communication is therefore impaired. And if we can get the brain and the neurons talking to each other even a year or two longer than without those drugs, um, your family member is going to have a better quality of life and you will too. So it's important not to ignore these things because you're afraid. And instead, I would like you to go and follow through with your doctor to see what's going on. Okay, so now we're gonna be moving into the second stage of the disease or the middle stage. There's going to be um, uh, this PDF that is uh, on the website. It has visuals of early, middle, and late. And underneath it has the common um, behaviors or symptoms that you see with each stage. So I just want to go through a few more that are common in early stage. Um, and one that we hear about a lot is that family members often will call us and complain that their, their spouse or parent seems to not have any zest for life anymore, that they um, are more isolated, they don't want to do anything. Um, they might even seem depressed. And depression actually is a very similar to early stage Alzheimer's disease. And it's, it's important to tease out whether or not it's depression or dementia. 
Again, this is something that your doctor can do. And if they're concerned that it might be depression, an antidepressant is prescribed. And if you come out of your funk, then we know what it was. If you don't, then we have to look further to see if indeed it is a dementia forming in the brain. Um, so I would say the loss of initiative, which again, you know, the planning and execution that occurs in the frontal lobe is where when that begins to wane, you're going to have loss of initiative. You're going to have ap apathy. And it's in this early stage that people with dementia are still aware that something's not quite right. And they're often anxious and they can get an, a hyper, hyper anxiety. They can begin to perseverate. And so for them, a social outing at a party may or may not, but often it is a, an, a chance where they get very anxious. And so um, we'll also get calls from family members. How do we deal with that? Um, another one that's on this list is a, a word that's probably unfamiliar to most of you, and it's called confabulation. And that's when the individual bases their response on a truth they believe to be true based on their past life and not current their current state. So the example would be if um, you asked, have you taken your pills today? And they said, yes, of course. I'm an adult. I know how to take my pills. And yet you're looking at the med box and you see all the pills are still there. Or have you taken a shower? And you hear, yes, I've taken a shower. And yet there's no evidence that a shower has been taken and they're still wearing dirty clothes. So they're not lying to you, which some people think you know, family members believe their, their parent or their spouse, spouse is lying to them, but no, they're, they're answering you in their most, most truthful way to what they believe is true. So I, I just want you to understand that and try to put yourself in their shoes for a moment. And they're just thinking back and going, hmm, of course I took a shower, I'm dressed. Of course, they don't real, realize that they have the same outfit on that they've had for the past five days, but again, they're still dressed. So um, visual spatial disturbances can start at this time as well. And that becomes more pronounced in the middle stage. So we're, with that, we're going to talk now about the middle stage of the disease. And with that in our diagram here, the disease has now moved into the parietal lobe. So if you remember, the parietal lobe is movement. And I said earlier that it's what's stored in the parietal lobe is everything that you've learned from infancy to adulthood that involves movement, or sequencing of movement, like brushing your teeth, combing your hair, writing, using a fork. Um, so the one way to actually think about this disease, whether it's Alzheimer's disease or one of the other dementias, is that it's growth and development in reverse. So first in, last out is the way that some people put it. Um, and really, if you want to know for sure where somebody is on their disease cycle, when they begin to have what we call functional loss. So functional would be anything that involves buttoning, zipping, walking, so gross motor movement or fine motor movement. Um, you now know that they're somewhere up into this disease. I'm, I'm sorry, they are up into the mid stages of the disease with the disease being in the parietal lobe. As I said earlier, the brain, the neurons are dying, the brain is shrinking, and by 
the end of the disease process, the, the brain is now a third of its original size. So the folks with dementia are doing the best they can. But our expectations are, particularly if you've lived with somebody m most of your adult life, your expectations of what somebody should be able to do and what they can actually do now is very different. So as a caregiver, you need to continually adjust your expectations. And yeah, unfortunately, there's more, more responsibility and more work rests on your shoulders. So a lot of things begin to happen that if we haven't yet seen you in the office yet for a care plan, now people are calling with a lot of problems. Um, this too is generally when people can have a lot of behavioral problems uh, and that is also due to the fact that we're going to, first of all, I want to say that we are going to be talking about behavior in one of, in the next segment actually, um, segment number two. But most of the chemicals that help transmit signaling in the brain are produced in the brain. And if the brain is shrinking, what does that tell you? It, it means that the chemicals are being depleted. And so the ability of neurons to communicate based on the chemical receivers that they're getting is going to begin to wane. And it, one of the analogies that I use a lot, and I think it's really helpful, is if you have a cir circuit box in your house and you've got 12 circuits, and now as the call for electricity is increased or the demand is increased and most of those circuits are gone, um, how the one or two circuits that are left are gonna trip. Another um, problem that can happen because of that is that people can get seizures. And that is also, you know, seizures, it's like too much electricity coming through the brain with nowhere for that impulse to be absorbed. And so the impulse is erratic. And that can happen periodically. It, it isn't anything to be afraid of, and it's usually not something that's treated unless it's happening on a regular basis. So the most common behaviors or, or problems that occur in mid-stage of the disease are um, more loss of ability to use language, more pronounced visual spatial disturbances. Right here where we have the occipital lobe and the movement lobe, so you've got an overlap here of um, where visual spatial relationships are connected. And you might see your family member having a difficult time, you know, finding the light switch, hitting the exactly where where it needs to go and they end up you know a little right of center or left of center um, there's more increased isolation because they don't want to engage with other people wandering can occur and this is a big problem because no one's a wanderer until they wander and so we have to anticipate that there is the chance that they might wander. And why do they wander, you ask? Well, they wander because they're looking for you. So you, we understand, you need to get out. You need to run errands. The whole responsibility of the household is now on your shoulders. And so you think, okay, I'll, you know, you tell your family member, okay, I'm going to the store. I'll be back in 10 minutes. They say, fine. You leave a note even, and you walk out the door. But remember, the hippocampus is no longer working. The gate is broken. So even though they say, fine, you can go. I'm fine here. As soon as you leave, they don't know where you went. And even though you left a note, they don't know to cue to read it. So consequently, they go looking for you. 
and you're not in the house, so they leave and they walk out the door. So that's we'll address that in um, session number two or three. But you have to understand that this is a strong possibility and we don't want someone being lost. If someone wanders and they're not found within 72 hours, they generally are not found alive. So it's really important that we um, take responsibility for this. Um, increased paranoia, delusions, hallucinations, which we're going to talk about in depth uh, in session number two. And then the one extra point that I want to make here is this is when incontinence starts. And incontinence does not start because dementia causes incontinence. What happens is that if you if you're watching this and you raise children and you think back to toilet training what you're trying to do is to get the child to connect with the sensation of needing to urinate with using the toilet and ultimately you become successful you pull your hair out a little bit as a parent but as I said, this is growth and development in reverse. So what happens is your family member has the sensation, but they forget what it means. And so they may have an accident and it may just be a one-off and not happen again for six months. And you think, oh, terrific. If this is incontinence, I think I can deal with this. But then six months later, it, you, you get two accidents. And a few months after that, you're getting them more frequently until within a year's time, your family member is now fully incontinent. And it's usually urine more than bowel, or ultimately it, it becomes both. But because personal hygiene begins to wane as well, generally because of lack of awareness on their part, and our belief that they're in there doing something and or even standing in a shower, but not necessarily cleaning themselves, we don't know, you know if they're fully clean. And certainly we know that the, the sequence of, of steps that in, is involved in toileting is so complex if you really break it down that my point being that urinary tract infections are rampant in this population of people with dementia, any kind of dementia. And so if you notice a behavior that has, that is different from the baseline level of confusion of your family member and has lasted more than 48 hours, chances are it's a urinary tract infection. And please call your primary care doctor and get a, a call over to the lab and take a specimen in because it can easily the agitation that is creating a heightened sense of anxiety and also causing you to to go nuts is often very well managed with an antibiotic and can be gone within a day or two so it's and if if someone's having one urinary tract infection, they generally get them a lot. So don't think just because it happened once and you treated it that it's something that doesn't come back because generally it does. So with that, we'll go into the late stages of the disease. The mid stage is over. We're now more progressed into the final stage or the late stage of the disease. And as I said, each stage can be two to five years. So because the middle stage involves movement and loss of movement or loss of functionality, one of the things that we notice more commonly and you might observe with your family member is that their gait begins to become very slow and hesitant. It's not a shuffling gait like somebody that has a Parkinson's disease, but it's a very slow, hesitant um, walk or gait because they're, they're trying to feel their way through space or navigate through space. 
um, with the um, visual spatial situation being compromised. And because of this, um, generally in the mid stage of the disease or towards mid late stage, they fall. And probably the most common problem or complication with any of the dementias is falling. And with a fall, the routine is changed because they have to go to the hospital and need to be attended to. And generally, because most people are older, um, they're prone to breaking a hip or another bone in their body and need to have surgery. And we do know that anesthesia can further propel one into their disease process, um, along with being in pain and being in an unfamiliar place and probably getting medication in the hospital to treat the, the post-op pain and then going to a rehab center for physical therapy. Some total, the person that went in prior to or who was functioning prior to the fall is now at a totally different level um, of care. And once someone goes down, they never go back up. So one way you can think about the disease progression for your planning needs is that about every three months, there's a plateau and a slight decline and then a plateau and a slight decline so you have these long step-like patterns. The big changes are every six months. So where you are now, if you are trying to think about yourself and your, your loved one, where you are now and where you're gonna be in six months now from now is going to be entirely different. And then six months from there will be different yet again. So you can use that as a planning tool but if the individual doesn't fall and they just go through the disease process, now in the late stage, we're in the occipital area, and that's the, um, the visual memory. And this is, this is the, the time where families often say, you know, I, I think I can care for somebody or my spouse or parent until they don't recognize me anymore. And, you know, often that's not the case. They'll, they will often recognize you. They may call you by a different name, but it doesn't mean that they don't recognize you or that your energy is very familiar to them and it's comforting to them, but they don't remember the relationship between you and them. But that's most predominantly what goes on there. And if someone is in late stage and they're still with us, often um, their cause of death is from aspiration or choking because swallowing is actually voluntary. We don't think about that because we sit down and we eat unconsciously, but if you remember back to the first time you had to swallow a pill and you put that pill in your mouth and you took a drink of water and your mother said, now, now swallow it, swallow it, swallow it, and you forced it down, it's a voluntary conscious act. And with all, our, all their senses now being depleted, they lose the ability to consciously remember how to swallow. And, and therefore, if food goes in their mouth, it, it has the chance of going into the trachea and, and the person ending up with pneumonia. So it's important to know that because alterations in the, the diet, the consistency of the diet, how they're fed, um, has to be accommodated. But generally, at this point, someone goes on hospice care. So that's something that we help you um, organize and we're here for you. So during the course of the presentation today, I mentioned a few times how important it is to have a care plan. And that is um, beyond educating you and supporting you, that's the one way that we can make sure that you're, you're organized for whatever your future holds. Um, 
in, I'm going to refer once again to this document and you'll see that under each stage is an intervention and the interventions here are what would be your care plan. So early on, um, without going into detail because everybody's situation is a little bit different, unless you're independently wealthy and can afford 24-hour care um, in an assisted living or in home, um, we want you to see an elder law attorney. You need to get all your legal documents in place to make sure, as I said earlier, that your family member is still competent to sign those. And there may be some things that the attorney suggests in terms of setting up a trust and things like that to safeguard um, your assets for nursing home. And nobody wants their family member to go to a nursing home, but sometimes it happens that often, particularly with the scenario of a fall or some other illness, that you find that you're not able to care for your family member yourself, that you have your own health needs or um, you're, you don't have the strength to, to do the personal care. So um, an elder law attorney will also do a Medicaid or Mass Health application and ready you for that. Um, also, uh, in terms of wandering and setting up, there's a program that every town has called Silver Alert. It's similar to Amber Alert for children, but Silver Alert for older adults. And you register with your local police department. Um, we have the applications here in the office and we're happy to give those out to you, email them to you, send them to you in the mail. Um, we have a variety of different bracelets and things that you can um, send away for that can identify your family member. So basically you need a, an emergency home care program and we can help organize that with you um, based on your preferences and you know, if, if other family members are not on board with the plan moving forward, we can also sit with you and have a family meeting and try to, try to get everybody on the same page. So with this, I hope you have a better understanding of Alzheimer's disease. I know I did not talk about the other dementias as this is primarily the, the disease that we're unfortunately ravaged by here on Cape Cod. And uh, the session number two will be behaviors and how to manage them, why they occur, and um, how to cope yourself with uh, tearing your hair out. So we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.